Well, I tell you what, I'll say wow. Matter of fact, I'll say it backwards, wow. Wow. I'll say it upside down, Mom. <laughs> That's wonderful. I like that good singing. I like the good spirit that's here. Amen? Amen. I tell you, we uh, many times folks say, you know, preacher, you try and get his clap hands. I'm just not emotional. And I always smile, and I think, yeah, yeah, I know you're not. <laughs> Let me see what happens. Somebody were to knock on your door and say you just inherited a million dollars. Let me see how non-emotional you are. <laughs> let me see. Let me see what happens for for wasp getting gets in your car. <laughs> let me see how non-emotional you are. <laughs> let me see what happens. Somebody cuts you off in traffic. <laughs> let me see how non-emotional you are. I'm just not emotional. I've got written in the fly leaf of my Bible, Lord, keep me alive until I die. Amen. <laughs> I do not want to dry up and die before it's my time. Amen. Amen. I want to enjoy the things of the Lord. Uh, he's talking about headed toward the finish line. I heard something the other day I'd never heard and never thought about. But uh, I have often said in my Christian walk, I, of course, I'm 60 eight years of age now, headed towards 69. And I have said often, I don't know of any place that I would like to go back to, any age. I don't know any age that i like to roll back to and say, well, I want to go back to that point again. I've said that often. But, but there was a, a, a younger man who had asked an older preacher, said, preacher said, uh, if you had to do over again, is there a place you would go back and start over from? And he said, oh, no. No, not at all. He said, uh, He said, you know, it's like when you're on a trip and said you're almost home. He said, you don't want to turn around and go back and start over. He said, you're almost to the house. And that's the way most of us who are older feel. We, uh, Of course, we still like living. I hope the Lord let me live another 20, 30 years. But, uh, but, uh, but if you don't, I'm telling you, I can, I can almost see the almost see the lights from the front porch <laughs> getting closer home amen, amen. Yes, and I don't know of any place that I would like to turn around and uh, and go back to well I echo what the preacher said I have enjoyed uh, the services so far and hope tonight the Lord will do more for us that uh, carry us to higher ground I, I know I've said this to you year after year after year um, I don't personally need a revival uh, when you, and I know I've said this probably a dozen times through the years, but, but when you need revival, it's because you've lost ground. If you, uh, if you faint and you're revived and you've lost, you lost something, if you have a business that fails and you revive it, then you've lost ground. And, and so I don't, I don't personally need revival. I have, uh, after 48 years of serving the Lord, I love Him more tonight than I have ever, ever loved Him. His word is more precious to me. Church, I love church more than I've ever loved it. I love God's people. I, I've just, I, my, my walk with God is one of the most thrilling, satisfying things that you could ever, ever imagine. And, and so I don't personally need revival, but I'm not satisfied with what I got. I want more. One of my favorite songs is, I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Higher ground, higher ground, always wanting to go to higher ground. I tell you, because in my 48 years, I've climbed the mountain, stood up there and said, ooh, what a beautiful sight. Oh, my, smell that fresh air. And then look over the way, and there's another mountain taller than the one I'm on. So down the valley I go, and up to the next mountain, and up to the top, and get up there and say, oh, my, what a view. <laughs> ah, smell that air. And then look over the way, and there's another one taller than that one. So down the valley I go, and up to the... And, and I just want to keep climbing to higher ground. Amen? Amen. Don't want to ever get satisfied or content. All right. Turn with me, if you will, please, to the book of Mark, chapter 9. Mark, chapter 9, for our scripture reading tonight. Mark, chapter 9. And once you find your place before you stand, let me ask you a couple of questions. I'd, I'd like for you, if you will, to get you a... Uh, well, let me ask the question first. How many, 
have someone that you've been praying for for some while, and it looks like they just get worse and worse and worse and nothing's changing. Can I see your hand, please? Could be a son or a daughter, a cousin, an aunt, uncle, a co-worker, but somebody that you're concerned about and you've been praying for for some time. Or it could be a situation. It just uh, may not be a person, maybe a situation that you're praying about. Uh, or it could be an opportunity that looks, uh, looks impossible. You think, well, good gracious, this thing is overwhelming to me, this opportunity that I have before me. And, and, uh, or maybe, maybe it's revival, that you're praying for revival in the church and, and the churches across the country. Now, uh, I was, last week I was in Kentucky, uh, Cornetsville, Kentucky. Uh, it's out from uh, Hazard, Kentucky, and and matter of fact, I preach in about five or six different churches in, in the area within about an hour of each other. And Cornetsville is just a real small little congregation with a, a wonderful group of people, people who believe God, walking with God. And I've been going there, I think this is maybe my sixth year. And uh, my first year there, there was a, there was a, a quartet that came to sing for us on, I think, on Sunday morning, and maybe it was a Sunday night. But anyway, one toward, toward the beginning of the service, there were three men and a lady, and the lady said to me after the service, she said, Brother Hayes, she said, I know you, I've met you before. And I said, well, I've preached in this area some, and, and uh, she said, did you ever preach in, I believe it was called Durham, Durham North Carolina, I mean Durham, Kentucky, uh, down to the foot of Jenkins, Kentucky. And I said, yes, as a matter of fact, I preached there in 1981. I said, I had a three-day meeting. Uh, Well, let me back up. I I preached actually in December a one-day meeting to a group of teenagers, about 12 teenagers. And and they were polite and and, and, um, listened okay. But you could tell they just weren't really that excited about the things of God, except for one guy, 18-year-old boy, and he came to the altar and he stayed and he stayed and he stayed and after about an hour and a half or two hours I told the folk, I said, I've got to get in the car and I've got to head across the mountain before the fog sets in. I said, uh, if y'all will stay with him. Well, that was in December. Well, they called me and asked me if I would preach a three-day meeting in January, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Well, I told Brother Ronnie, my associate, I said, and Brother Ronnie, I've got, a, I've got a funeral on Thursday night so I won't get to go. So why don't you go on and preach on Thursday night and tell them I'll be there on, thir- on Friday night. And I said, just, just a little group of people. I said, just do the best you can. And he said, all right. So anyway, on uh, Friday morning, he came down to the house and he said, boy, he said, you're going to be in for a surprise when you go tonight. And I said, oh, tell me about it. He said, well, if I did, you wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> so I drove over the mountain on Friday night. And uh, when I got there, uh, the place was packed. It wasn't just a little group of people. It was packed. Matter of fact, they were spilled out into the vestibule and out down the sidewalk. And, and I couldn't get in the front door, so I went around to the side and tried to get into the side door and, and couldn't get in the side. And, and so finally I said, Folk, I'm the preacher. I need to get in. And so, so they made a way for me, and in I went and, and preached on Friday night. Boy, God got in that meeting, preached on Saturday night. And it was supposed to end on Saturday night. Well, they went on Sunday and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. And we had 48 people saved in that meeting that week. God got in the And I asked them, I said, can you tell me what happened? They said that one boy that came to the altar back in December got stirred about revival and began to believe that God can send revival and encouraged us to pray with him and believe and said, we got to praying morning, noon, and night. And this is the result of it. And so that lady was in that quartet. She said, I was in that meeting. And she said, I'll never forget the impact that made upon my life. So what I'm saying to you is, if you've got a person that you're praying for, or a situation that you're facing that looks impossible, or an opportunity that's overwhelming, if, you, if, you've got, if you're just praying for revival... If you're like myself, you, you, you don't have any problem believing that God has the power to, but what I know you can, 
but this has been going on a long time. Lord, I know there's nothing impossible with you, but <laughs> this person has been, you know, in this shape for a long, how many know what I'm talking about tonight? And, and so we want to look at that, that dilemma that we get to sometime, and that's what our story is about. What I want you to do, if you will, I want you to take a piece of paper and a little scrap piece of paper, tear it off, take your pen, and I want, want you to write down the name of that person you lifted your hand for a while ago, that son, that daughter, that cousin, that grandson, whatever, or a situation you're facing, or if it's about revival. Whatever it is that you lifted your hand and said, I believe that, that uh, I, God wants that person saved, won't that, wants us to have revival, whatever. And, and you, you, if you'll write that thing down on the piece of paper, because here's what I'm going to do. At the end of my message, I want to invite you to symbolically bring that situation, that opportunity, that person to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to bring them. You write their name on the paper, and when we give the invitation, you bring them to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you do that for me, I'd be very, very grateful. All right, for those who can and will, stand with us, please. Mark chapter 9, the story is about a daddy who has been battling for his son. His son is demon-possessed. And the daddy has tried to get the boy help and tried to get the boy help and tried. Right, for years, the daddy has tried to help the boy. And finally, he's brought the boy to the preacher's. And the preachers tried to help him and they failed. Now the daddy could have said in his mind, I wonder if my boy is beyond help because these preachers have helped other people. Is my boy beyond help? Because, because it, it appears that they can't help him. I'm sure he must have felt like a failure. I love my boy, but I've tried. And, and as a matter of fact, just today I talked to a lady who has tried and tried and tried with her daughter and, and her daughter has gotten worse and worse and worse and, and, and she called me today and she said, a am I making the right decision? We talked about what she should do and I said, you're definitely making the right decision. She said, I feel like a failure. And if something's been going on for a long time, you get frustrated. You get, you get to the place you just don't know what else to do about it. And so this dad had, had uh, been trying to help his boy and he finally brought him to the preachers and the preachers weren't able to help him. And, and uh, I want you to look at verse 17. One of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son which had a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he tarrieth him and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out and they could not. Verse 20, they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, of a child. He said, been going on a long time. Been a bad situation for a lot of years. And oftentimes it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters, watch this, to destroy him. Now that's the goal of the enemy. When he targets your child, when he targets your marriage, when he targets your church, when he targets you as an individual, his goal is to destroy. He doesn't, he's not satisfied just hurting or upsetting. He wants to destroy. Now thank the Lord for Christians, he can't destroy our soul. But he sure can destroy your marriage. He can destroy your home. He can destroy your church. And so he said, he cast him in the fire into the waters to destroy him. Watch this. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible. And watch, this is where most of us have been. And straightway, the father of the child cried out and said him with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Thank you so much. You may be seated, if you will, please. Now I want to draw your attention to two or three things. First of all, you understand that this situation has been going on for a long time. And I don't know of anything that is more discouraging and, and, 
and frustrating than to see a situation go on and on. And, well, let me just take the Adam revival. I, I've been in churches. I've been going to some churches for 48 years. Went to some churches when I, when I was 20 years of age. Went there to preach my first revival when I was 20 years of age. Been going there for 48 years. And those same churches have been praying for revival and praying for revival and praying for 48 years. I've encouraged them to pray for revival and revival hadn't come. Well, after a while, if you're not careful, you get to the place you think, you wouldn't say it out loud, but what's the use? But this had been going on for a long time, and, 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 and again, I'm sure the dad feels like a failure, but, but, but I want to draw your attention to something else, and that's the fact that, 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 that the boy does not need your criticism. He does not need your anger. He needs your compassion. You see, if we're not careful when, when, when somebody's been on drugs and we've helped them get into rehab and, and then they get out of rehab and right back into the old lifestyle again, we'll get a little frustrated and, and angry at them. And, and, but you have to understand that when a person's under the, under the influence of the devil, they're beside themselves. They can't just snap out of it. It's, it's not that simple. It's not a matter of saying, why don't you just straighten up and and fly right. Why don't you turn around and do what's right? You got enough sense. No, no, no. Listen, when you're under the power of a supernatural power, you need supernatural help. And so the boy doesn't need our anger. He doesn't need our, our criticism. Again, if we're not careful, we'll blame We'll blame other things and forget who the real enemy is. For instance, if the boy, the daddy could have said, I'm telling you, if he hadn't just got with that, that, that wrong crowd, and I agree that a wrong crowd can, can certainly play into the situation, but the real enemy is the devil. The devil uses the wrong crowd. Well, if we just stay away from that music, I understand but Satan uses the music. The real enemy is Satan himself. Now, the reason I point that out is because if you're not careful, you'll get mad at the crowd. I hear preachers say about revival, they say, well, preacher, this is just a hard area. And they get mad at the area. Wait a minute. The real enemy is not the area. The enemy is, the, is Satan himself. Can you say amen to that? I'm de- don't forget who the enemy is. You just, you cannot take your eyes off of, I mean, again, he uses music, he uses entertainment, he uses education, he uses all these other things, and I don't disagree with that. But I'm telling you, you've got to understand behind all of that is the real enemy, and that's the devil himself. So we've got to keep our eyes on who the real enemy is, because if you're not careful, you begin to get angry at, at the people. You get angry at the area, you get and, and so you've got to remember who the enemy is. So the daddy brings the boy and, and, and the preachers fail to help him and, 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 and finally Jesus says to him, well, how long has this been going on? He said, since he's a little boy. And he said, if you can do anything, help me. And Jesus says, if you can believe, then all things are possible. I don't care who it is you've been praying for, it's possible for God to save them. I don't care what the situation is, God is big enough to help you handle it. If it's revival, God, is a, God can send revival. Whatever it is we're praying for. And, 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 and he says, if you can believe, then all things are possible. And the daddy said, well, Lord, I do believe. But you're going to have to help my unbelief. And again, I've been there. Lord, I'm telling you, I know that you can change the drunkard's life. Don't have any doubt about that. But this person had been drinking for so long. I know that you can set the drug addict free. And and I don't have any doubt about that. But, Lord, they've been in it time after time after time. And and, and let me know what I'm talking about tonight. You've been there and you've had that... I don't have any problem believing that you're powerful enough. I know you can. I know you want to, but. Well, I know you can send revival, but. 
the area we're in. It's a, it's a highly educated area. People, people are very religious and so forth and so on. And, 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 and if we're not careful, we, we have this struggle with, with faith and doubt. And faith and doubt. But the daddy in his heart had said, my boy needs help and he needs help that I cannot give him. This situation is bigger than me. It's bigger than the preacher's. And the only one that I know that can help him is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he brought him to Christ. He brought him to Christ. And I'm telling you, can you see that boy and his daddy when they walk away from that, that situation that day? I'm telling you, can you see them arm in arm and laughing because the boy has been set free after years and years and years. Now I'm talking about bringing them to Jesus, bringing them to Let me tell you a story that I've told you before, and then we'll go back and tell you the story behind the story. But, but uh, some years ago, one of the men, um, his sister-in-law said to him, said, Howard, said, I want you to, want you to go to church with me. And, and uh, he'd say no, and he'd say no, and he'd say, and finally one day he said, all right, Arlene, I'll go to church with you if you'll cook me some of your biscuits. He loved her biscuits. She said, you got a deal. She said, you come Sunday morning before church. I'll cook you some biscuits. We'll eat them. Then off to church we'll go. He said, all right. So he showed up on Sunday morning. She cooked him some biscuits and, and off to church they came. And he came and he said to my right, and I'm, I'm talking about a burly, a weightlifter, burly looking guy, rough looking fellow. I mean rugged looking. And I preached that morning, gave the invitation, and boy, out of his pew he came, ran to the altar, fell over here about, about, uh, about midway in that altar there, and, and, and you could hear him crying out, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner, and I want you to save me. And boy, he lifted his hands toward heaven, and, and, and he got up, and I said, I, I said, tell me, did you get saved? He said, boy, I got saved. Feels good. And I said, all right, now you want to begin your Christian walk in the right way. I said, won't you be back to service tonight? And be back Wednesday night. And then if you don't have a Bible, I'll get you a Bible and, and, and you need to get in the scriptures and, and, and get your prayer life started. I said, you get, get started, I mean, from the get-go. You get into this thing and, and jump in it. Don't wait around. I mean, jump out there and swim in it and get involved, I mean, quickly. And he said, I'll be back tonight. I said, all right. So that night, I came back to the service and I don't see it. And I'm disappointed. I stood right there and told him, if you're going to get started right, you need to be back in church tonight. Because if you get saved on Sunday night, you should, I mean Sunday morning, you should be in church on Sunday Amen. night. And I don't see him. And I'm disappointed. So I went ahead and preached, and after the service, I saw this nice looking gentleman there, and I went over and introduced myself to him. I said, I'm glad to have you tonight. I said, um, Appreciate you being in the service. He said, well, I was here this morning. I said, well, I guess I missed you. I'm glad you're here then. He said, well, I got saved this morning. I said, well, I said, did somebody take you down a hall and deal with you or something? Because I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't see you get saved this morning. He said, I got saved right over there. Well, my mind is going all kind of directions because I can't get a hold of what's going on. He's telling me something. And, and the only guy I know that got saved was this rugged looking guy. And I said, sir, I'm confused. I said, I, I, he, he, he grinned, he reached in his back pocket, pulled out his wallet, showed me his driver's license, and it was that guy. That rugged looking guy had gone home that afternoon after getting saved and cleaned himself up, and he's a handsome fellow. Well, maybe that's pushing it, but anyway... <laughs> But, uh, but, but nice looking fella. And, and, uh, and, and, and listen, he got in there and boy, he began to walk with God and now he leads our choir and, and that, was, that was 30 some odd years ago. But I'm telling you, listen, I, I, I'm telling you, the biscuits help. But let me tell you the story behind the story. When he was a teenage boy, he was a drunk. Had a praying mama. He said, I'd stay out till 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning because he said, I knew when I walked in the door, my mama would be on her knees praying for me. And I dreaded seeing her pray for me. But that little mama kept bringing him to Jesus and, and bringing him to Jesus and, and bringing. And he said, preacher, one day, one night I was going down the road and, and the devil whispered to me and said, why don't you just aim for that, that tree and, and hit that tree head on and it would all be over. Of course, it wouldn't have been over. He'd have been in hell. 
That doesn't, death doesn't end it all at all. He said, but I swerved and missed it and, and, and said, when I got home, walked in and there's my little mama on her knees praying for her son. God set him free. Set him free. And so year after year after year, though the situation had been going on a long time, year after year, that little mama kept bringing him to the only one that can help him, bringing him to Christ who had the power to do something. I'm sure there were times when she wondered if it was going to work. I'm sure there were times when she wasn't sure if God was going to do anything, but she kept on believing and saying, Lord, I know you can, I know you can. There's nothing impossible with you. And God saved that man because her mama knew how to pray. Thank God for folk. Though you, though you have this, 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 I believe, but you've got that. I know that. But don't, don't quit praying because of that. You just keep trusting the Lord and, 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 and praying for revival. I mean, that situation, whatever it is, you just keep praying and bringing them to Jesus. Uh, here back in October, I was up in Asheville, North Carolina, and I was standing out in the vestibule, large vestibule, and and they had pictures lined up down the hall of, of former days, uh, homecomings and, and uh, other special events, large crowds and so forth. And, and I'm standing looking at this, this picture and it's a, a large crowd of people there. And, and, and the preacher came up behind me and he said, Preacher, let me show you something. He said, you see that guy over here? And he pointed to a man, had a hat and a tie and everything. He said, you see that guy there? And I said, yes, sir. He said, that man was one of the meanest men in this county. He said, wicked and vile and wretched. And I'm telling you, everybody was afraid of him. And said, Al Capone had heard of him and sent a man down to recruit him to come to Chicago and begin working with Al Capone. Now, Al Capone was a, a mobster and a gangster and and so he had sent a man down to recruit this guy because of his reputation to come back to Chicago and work with him with Al Capone. He said he's supposed to got on a train on Sunday night and headed to Chicago and said his little mama, who was a praying woman, a member of this church, said, son, I know you're supposed to go to Chicago tonight. But said, please go to church with your mama this morning. Said, just one time, if you will. That won't hurt you. Just one time. Would you, would you do that for your mama? Just come to church with me today. And, 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 and so he said, all right, all right. I'll go to church with you this morning. And that vile and wicked and wretched man, that man so full of sin and hatred and, 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 and listen, that man who was going to go work with Al Capone came to church with his praying mama that morning and, and, and that morning she went to the altar and brought that boy to Jesus and, and brought that boy to Jesus and brought that boy to Jesus and, 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 and out, of that aisle, out of that pew he came and down that aisle and knelt beside his little old mama and cried out for the Lord to save him. He didn't get on the train on Sunday night. Matter of fact, he went on and joined the church and got baptized, became a deacon, became a preacher. And the preacher standing there pointing at him said, he has started, I don't know how many churches in this area through the years. Because the mama said, I know you can. I know my boy is full of sin and he's vile and wretched, but Lord, you can do something for him. And, and, and that little mama kept bringing that boy to Jesus. And our Lord set him free and made a preacher out of him. I say amen to that. Amen. <laughs> bringing him to you. Lord, I believe but you're going to have to help my unbelief. I was in Covington, Indiana here just a few weeks ago and granddaddy came to me on Sunday morning and, and he said, Preacher, I want you to help me pray for my grandson. He said, he's a, he's a vile, wicked man and said, 
said, uh, I, I love him and, and I've been praying for him. And I said, he said, I just, I, I've just about lost hope about praying for him. Don't know if he's ever going to get saved. Don't seem to be interested. I said, write his name down on a piece of paper. And when I give the invitation, you bring him to Christ. And because he's the only one who can help. You can't help him, you can love him. But your love's not going to change him. I can love him, but my love's not going to change him. There's only one person who's equal to the task, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And I said, when I give the invitation, you come and bring that boy to the altar. And then call him tomorrow and invite him to come to the service. He said, I'll do it. So that granddaddy came and knelt at the altar and Next day, called that grandson and invited him. I think grandson's 26 years of age. Great big old brute of a guy. I'm telling you, just a big barrel-chested guy. I mean, big old. And, uh, and, and so Monday night, the granddaddy came to me and pointed. He said, there's my grandson. I said, well, we're going to pray that God will do something for him. Well, that boy came Monday night. He came Tuesday night. He came Wednesday night. He came Thursday night, and, and Thursday night, I've already quit preaching. I've gotten down off the platform. I've come over here, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm bowing in prayer I'm, because people are still at the altar, and I'm standing here praying and, and asking God to do great work in the, in the invitation that night. And, 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 and I heard a commotion, and I looked up, and there's that, grand, <laughs> there's that granddaddy with that great big old burly grandson. Got him around the arm, and the, and the grandson just squalling like a baby, and they're walking across the front here, and the granddaddy grinning like a, like a Cheshire cat and, and looks at me, and he says, <laughs> and they went on back into the back room and were gone for a while, and when they come out, that grandson and the granddaddy both were crying, and that grandson stood and said, Oh, thank God for praying, granddaddy. Lord, I know you can, but it sure has been going on a long time. Lord, I know it's possible, but I've been praying for this. So, Lord, there's no question in my mind you're equal to the task, but this is such a big thing. I believe, but you're going to have to help my unbelief because I'm struggling. Be honest with God. Just be honest with Him. And watch what He does. I'm telling you, listen, you wrote that person's name down or that situation a while ago, a revival. I, Lord, I believe. But I sure have been praying for it for a long time. And just watch what happens. Would you stand with us for prayer, please?